Hello, my name is Peter Gray, and I am the playwright of Forbidding Love, which is a tale of two workers in a not-too-distant future who are tasked with purging the texts of Romeo and Juliet of any offensive content. And as they work side by side, um, discussing this filthy, filthy text and the filthy, filthy man who penned it, sparks begin to fly, and a whole new relationship of its own comes into fruition. Well, one of the reasons that I think these texts remain classics and have been passed down from time to time and remain performed today is that they speak to structures and ideas far beyond their time and specifics. And particularly, I was looking at Romeo and Juliet and the balcony scene, which is one of the most romantic in all of literature, and looking at the structure of that. And it's these two vulnerable souls who are dancing around saying the one thing that they truly mean of, I love you, or you're hot, or, um, you know, whatever. They're using metaphor and wordplay in this game of it to avoid that vulnerability. And it made me think a lot about the structures of our modern times and the Hayes Code and um, censorship and self-censorship and what it means to dance around what is and isn't appropriate and uh, not wanting to offend and that felt like an exciting thing to explore in this modern world. Hi, my name is Delaney Kelly and I wrote One Moment Please about a contemporary narcissist and his futuristic Amazon Echo-like device. In this play, I wanted to use the classic Roman story to interrogate love and relationships in the modern age, and how the rise of AI may interfere with genuine human connection. I think we ultimately all desire emotional intimacy, but human flaws and all of our distinct needs and wants are inherently less satisfying than a hyper-curated algorithm that, this play argues, is not unlike Narcissus gazing at his own reflection. I really enjoyed reimagining this classic story because I think its longevity in the Western canon speaks to how it can be continuously reinterpreted for newer audiences. When I think of the Metamorphoses in particular, I think that Ovid was myth-making the origins of the human condition, and it really shows that we as humans have always been kind of screwed up, and there's a comfort in that, I think. God of Love is an exploration of that unique relationship in which one person knows nearly everything about the other and one person doesn't know the other at all, aka therapy. It's based on the myth of Cupid and Psyche. Psyche, a mortal, is allowed to marry Cupid, a god, under the condition that she can never see him. So I've reimagined that imbalanced relationship and all of the beauty and sadness and magic that comes with it. I found writing using a classical myth as inspiration to be really freeing in the kind of confinement that it provided. Um, as a writer, I often struggle to get started. So with this myth as the framework, as the structure, um, sort of like a safety net in some ways, um, I was really able to kind of break free within those boundaries um, and discover things that I definitely wouldn't have. Um, it was also really fun and challenging to figure out how to stay true to the story while also making it new. So which plot points to adhere to, which I could take creative liberty with, um, and to hopefully breathe life into this ancient story. Hi, I'm Craig Lucas, and I'm the author of the Western canon. And I was asked to say in under 30 seconds what the Western canon is about. And I have 10 seconds left. And I would say that it's about two sisters who haven't seen each other in a very long time who meet in a very low place. The great advantage of Greek and Roman drama <clears throat> it seems to me is that those myths are about a tremendous level of duplicity and violence and the derangement of reason 
and the only other subject really that would suit that is the current Republican Party. And this has a certain elegance that is lacking thereof. Hello, my name is Maggie Lou Rader and I wrote Conferring by the Parlor Fire. This play is about Shakespeare's three women in The Taming of the Shrew, Kate, Bianca, and the Widow, when they leave stage at the end of the show to confer by the parlor fire. Uh, if you're anything like me, I've always wondered what Shakespeare's women talk about when they are alone and without an audience, and this might give you some reasons as to why Kate comes in with some different opinions uh, at the end of the show. Uh, I love using classical text as a jumping off point in my writing because, uh, well, it tends to be pretty good, you know, if a story's stuck around for a few hundred years. Uh, however, first and foremost, classical texts were made for the male gaze, the white gaze, the cisgender gaze, and uh, using it as a jumping off point. As a modern storyteller, uh, it at least allows me to look at these beautiful uh, pieces of art and find what is true to me today in them. Um, and hopefully in doing so, bringing classical work to a much more equitable place as a modern storyteller who does love these classic works um, and finding what's true for more people today than perhaps when they were created. Hi, my name is Heather Raffo, and the play I've been working on for Red Bull's 10 Minute Play Festival is about the roots of ownership as a legacy for empire and how deeply that has impacted our narratives, our relationships, and our bodies. Um, my specific play is told from the point of view of a woman who's undergoing surgery and in this sort of fever dream of her anesthesia, she ends up having a really interesting conversation with her neighbor who might also be her surgeon. <laughs> I was really excited by this opportunity from Red Bull Theater to sort of unpack how classical theater has impacted my own work. I um, got my MFA at the Old Globe Theater in San Diego with a huge emphasis on Shakespeare and my undergraduate degree was in classical literature. So I've dedicated a huge part of my life to to um, the studies of classical literature. Um, but more and more recently as an Arab American, I've been kind of troubled in my relationship to how classical narratives are meant to speak for universal situations when I think that modern times really demand modern narratives. So with this opportunity, I was digging around in origin stories um, and realize that so many of our origin stories do come out of empires because it's empires that are creating classical texts that we then canonize. And of course, America is an empire. So I um, allowed my characters to really embody um, their own feelings about that um, narrative of empire um, as they're searching, searching as neighbors for a shared root system. I'm Jackie and I wrote Taboo is the Thing. When I sat down to write this play, um, I think I was in the frame of mind of actors such as myself, when we've worked with classical texts in the past, we've sort of been in the frame of mind of the aura around the text and the history of it and the pressure of needing to prove yourself worthy of using it. And so I wanted to write a play that poked fun at that. Um, so my characters are literally stuck in their roles and they have annoyed the god Dionysus um, and they spend the whole play um, trying to free themselves. It actually didn't take long uh, to figure out the classical plays I wanted to use or the, the characters from them, um, you know, to support my theme and to support the theme of the, of the Red Bull play festival this year um, because there's just obviously a plethora to choose from and the stock characters that we have in classical theater often just have such juicy and really specific um, points of view and um, 
points of being in the plot of, of various plays that it was actually so much fun choosing them and I had a hard time deciding, oh, I, I used Oedipus, I used uh, the nurse from Juliet, I used Antigone, um, but there's so many other ones. This is for sure. am, I, am I using the right ones? Um, so I kind of played around with a few, but settled on these ones um, and it was enormous fun. Uh, and I love um, watching classical theater when it has a modern spin. Um, and so I did try um, a kind of, that was my modus operandi really, was to bring a modern kind of thought process um, and a bit of a lilt of the language into uh, my not traditional verse. Um, and so that's kind of how I approached it. So Iphigenia has been told by her father, Agamemnon, that before he can begin the Trojan War, he must first make a sacrifice to a goddess, and that the sacrifice must be his daughter's life. Iphigenia is going to be murdered by her father, uh, and this play is about her last night on Earth. It's about Iphigenia reckoning with what to do with the rest of her life, which, as it turns out, isn't going to be very much longer. The opportunity to engage with classic text um, feels like an invitation to engage with sort of the continuity of these questions that, that, that people have been asking over the course of generations about just like how fundamentally weird it is to live as a human being on this planet. And uh, I'm just really grateful for the opportunity to uh, get to explore that.